or they know uh, maybe a family member that they want to, that's maybe falling away, but they want to have a personal Bible study with. That's right. Anybody? Come on, there's got to be somebody going to have a personal Bible study, right? It's free. You mean that you will go and study, have a personal study with somebody? I will tell you that this is a rarely, a fairly new Bible study lesson plan. They, they put it out at Polishing the Pulpit. 95% of the people that watch that video become New Testament Christians. Pretty good rate. Anybody want it for a personal Bible study? Okay, I bought a thousand of these, so a bunch more are coming, but just the first batch came in. So y'all can have y'alls in the next couple of weeks. 95% of in pretty good odds. Yesterday, um, I teach a class every Tuesday for a business downtown. And yesterday when I was waiting to go in to teach the class, there were a couple of men that were sitting there eating lunch, and they were discussing the Bible. I'm just one of those kind of people, okay? So I sat down with them, and I said, y'all mind if I eat lunch with y'all for a few minutes? They had chocolate pie, and it was good, so they gave me a piece of chocolate pie, and that was my lunch. And I said, well, let's, let's, uh, y'all continue on your conversation. I was just listening. And one of them said that, he goes, you know, in our church, we call the minister, Reverend. He was talking to the other gentleman that was sitting there. He said, that's just not right. I, you know, I, I can't find that. We were, I, in fact, the Bible, from the way I understand it, says you're not supposed to do that. So sort of opened the door there, right? So I asked him, I said, do you, do you know what, the, he sounded very knowledgeable of the Bible, by the way, and I said, do you know what the five avenues of worship are? He said, well, I know that every Sunday we're supposed to give. I said, that's right. And I gave him the Bible verse for that. And he said, we're supposed to pray. And I said, oh, yes. And I gave him the Bible verse for that. He said, we're supposed to hear from God's word. And I said, that is exactly right. He said, we're supposed to sing. I said, yeah, Ephesians 5, 19, we're supposed to sing. Sing together and encourage each other in, in songs and hymns, spiritual songs. He said, oh, I agree with that. He said, well, isn't that it? So what did he leave out? Hmm. I told him that. I said, well, you left out the Lord's Supper. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, we, we do that once a quarter. I said, okay, can we agree if we go further with this conversation that we're going to do everything that the Bible says and nothing what a man says? He said, oh, yes, that's it. That's, we, we can't do what man says. I said, okay. Where in the Bible does it say that you can partake of the Lord's Supper once a quarter? He said, well, I don't know. I said, well, let's look at some examples real quick on when we are to partake of the Lord's Supper. And every one of them are the first day of the week. And I said, well, if you go by your theory of what you've been doing, which quarter is correct? Which day? Which, which, how do you pick that first day of the week on each quarter? And he said, well, that's a very good point. He said, we've not been doing it right. Well, little did I know that the other gentleman, when I brought up the next subject, what his religion was. And I said, by chance, do you know which of the Ten Commandments from the Old Testament is not repeated in the New Testament? And they both were naming off pretty much all the Ten Commandments and going through. And I said, but there's one that's not repeated. Do you know which one that was? And he, he said, no, can you help us out? And I said, what day of the week do you worship on? And one said Sunday and one said Saturday. I said, oh. Okay. The one that said Saturday, Seventh-day Adventist, he is new to our country. He is from Africa. And he is here. He married a U.S. citizen. He has his papers and all that stuff for all the political stuff that was sitting there. And I said, why did you, why, why did you become Seventh-day Adventist? He said, you know, Paul, I really don't know. Um, I, I really don't know. And I said, well, let's look at the God's Word and find out when we're supposed to worship, what day we're supposed to worship, how often we're supposed to worship, and how God wants us to worship Him. 
And he said, I, I would love for someone to, to tell me that. I've been searching for that. So we did. And I know a few of y'all know this, but every day, well, right now it's sort of sketchy because it's tax season. Every day I try to do a Bible lesson on Facebook. And I asked these two gentlemen, I said, would y'all mind joining our daily Bible class? And they said, no, no, please sign us up. So I signed them up on their phones and got them into the Bible class. And uh, I got a call last night from the young man that's the Seventh-day Adventist, and he said, could I call you sometimes and just ask you questions? And I said, oh, you're more than welcome to call me anytime. And I said, please, at this time of year, try not to call me after 9 o'clock. And he said, but what if I have a question after 9 o'clock? I said, call me. <laughs> so I always tell them in that class they can call me anytime except from 8 to 10 on Sunday mornings, unless they want to go to church with me, and I'll take them out to eat, and then they can talk about stuff. But they can call me anytime. My phone rang about three weeks ago at midnight. I answered the phone, and they said, we were just testing to see if it was true. And I was like, okay. So but no, they can call me anytime and talk to me. The, um, there is an eagerness out there still for God's word. There's an eagerness of people wanting to learn. They just don't know how. They, they're just doing and repeating what the way they grew up, or what mama taught them, or you know, what daddy did, or grandpa did. They don't know the truth. And Jesus commands us as his disciples to go out and to teach them. It doesn't mean everybody you're going to teach is going to become a New Testament Christian. But our job is to teach, to plant seed. God said he'll take care of it from there. We just have to go out and do our job. <clears throat> One of the things that I've been seeing lately as a movement or a movement within the church is a lot of people just don't know how to worship God. What does God expect of me after I become a Christian? How do I worship God? Is it just going through because that's the way everybody else has always done it? Or do we really know from God's word what God wants us to do in our worship service to him? So when Tim approached me and said, Paul, you know, you can pick up from you know, where I left off on the Wednesday night class or you can do something different. I said, well, I'm going to do something different because I'm like you and I, I'm, I'm eager to learn and I really don't want to miss one of Tim's classes. So we got something new for the next four weeks, okay? We're going to learn or relearn how and why we worship the way that we worship. I would invite you to take lots of notes because we're going to be moving rather quickly because of the time constraint. We have so much material to cover. But we I also want to invite you, if you have family or friends that maybe have fallen away, to invite them to this Wednesday night service so they can learn about what true worship is. Our society now has gone from a you know, a, a reverence for God to a worship type service that is what's in it for me. So that's why um, it's just really uh, provided the opportunity for me to, to go over these lessons. I, I love this series of lessons and it helps me as much as it helps you. And I've told y'all before, the way I prepare lessons is really not for y'all, it's for me. Y'all just get to hear Paul's thoughts, okay? All right, so our first class is going to be on true worship. What is it? <clears throat> We're going to go um, frequently back to John chapter 4 and verses 20 through 24. So I'd like for a class to begin with someone reading that for us, John chapter 4, verses 20 through 24. Brother Tarnell, do you have that? Yeah, just, just read it for us. 20 through 24. 20 through 24. <clears throat> Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. 
God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So today, a lot of people go to church for what they can get out of worship service. Uh, I even had a friend that would go check the Saturday paper to see who was playing at the church, the big church over on 459, see who could entertain him. He just thought that that was, uh, you know, there'd be certain groups that would come in and perform, and he would check the paper to see when they were going to be back in town because he wanted to go to worship on those days. That's entertainment. That's not worship. Some go because they like the big production. Uh, there's a, a large church uh, that also puts out, they do a satellite out to all different churches within the state, and everybody oohs and awes over what a great production that they put on in their worship service. That's not worship. That's a production. And there's this, this so-called big staged uh, worship that they have in the big theaters and in the big uh, stadiums. And people go just because they're caught up in the excitement of going to see a certain speaker in there. They're not going to hear God's word. They're going to see a speaker. That's entertainment. That's not worship. <coughs> worship is about giving. It's not about getting anything. It's about giving to God, giving God reverence. It's not um, an act, or it, it, and it's not an emotion. It's coming from within you, with what Darnell just read. It's, it's our spirit and worshiping God the way he desires to be worshiped. So he is the one that's receiving our worship. It's not anything that we are to get out of it. Um, I talked to somebody in my office the other day. I was talking to them about where they attended and, and what went on in their worship service. And she was saying, well, you Church of Christ people are just, you know, too static. Y'all, y'all are just, uh, y'all just don't move around enough. And it's like, okay, what do y'all do? She goes, when I worship, I got to be moving. Got to be shaking. Got to be going. And it's like, well, what do you get out of that? And it's like, well, it's just the excitement of it. And I said, oh, there it is. I get excited. That's not worship. That's excitement. They're, they're getting instead of giving to God. Worship defined. The definition of worship is really hard to define. But I'm going to try to put some, some things together so you understand where that word comes from. Um, it comes from an old English word called worth-ship. And if you look over at um, maybe Revelations chapter 4 and verse 11, or Revelations 5 and verse 12, you'll learn that God, only God, is worthy of worship. Not man, not idols. Not beast and all those kind of things. Only God is worthy. Worthship. Worthy of being worshipped. There's um, the Hebrew word translated into our English Bibles as worship is shakah, which means to bow down and do homage. So as we offer worship to God, it is bowing down, paying homage to him because he is worth worship. The only thing that, or person that can be worshipped is our God. In Genesis 18.2, Abraham bowed before the divine visitors. In Exodus 4.31, uh, the people bowed their heads and they worshipped. And in Exodus 12.27, they prostrated their bodies in a principle to show their reverence in worship. The Greek word for worship is Proskuneo, which means to kiss the hand toward. It's um, the word that Jesus used in John 4. And the word he used there carries the word for reverence. So reverence to God. Another word used for worship is latruo, which means to serve or to minister. And then there's another closely related word, which was leturgos, and it means in a priestly manner. An insight into uh, as we approach God, we approach Him in a priestly manner, and that's in First Peter chapter two, verses five, and again in verse nine. So, if you put all that together, here's what the best definition that you can have for worship: worship is ascribed to God, 
It's done in a spirit of wonder, awe and reverence, and our hearts are bowed before him. It involves our attitude of awe and reverence and respect and our action of bowing and praising and serving. It's a word that's both subjective and objective in activity. It is a balanced activity involving your mind, your emotions, and your will. It has to be done in an intelligent manner. It has to reach deep within the person, motivating them by love. And then it must lead to obedient actions that glorify God. Turn over to uh, Psalms chapter 45 and verse 1. <clears throat> and look at what David said when he's thinking of worshiping God. He said, my heart is overflowing. That is the true definition of what you should feel when you're in worship to God. It's from within and your heart is just overflowing just because you're able to come into the presence of God and worship Him. It's a huge honor to even come. <clears throat> I, I, I tell a lot of times about when Steve Brown and I used to, the first Gulf War, they dispatched us over. It was a real dangerous situation. They sent us to London, England. <clears throat> so we got, both got to travel around a lot. And one of the places that uh, Steve and I wanted to go to was out in the middle of, of the UK. It was at a castle that had been fully restored. And as you come into the castle, I mean, you are, you're just taken back by the grandeur of things like the throne room. And the throne room had these huge doors to protect the king. And as you came in, there were all these little alcoves where they would have guards that were in there. That stood down the room just to enter the doors to come into the throne room to see the king. And as you entered the throne room, there's lots of alcoves and they're up and they're down and they're behind the throne. And they tell you, no one got to see the king unless the king invited him to come into his presence. You would never make it. You wouldn't make it through the door. You, they would kill you if you were there uninvited. It's a great honor to enter the throne room in a worship service to God. And we've got to respect that. We've got to have that awe when we come into the presence of God from within, that we're allowed to come into the presence of our Father and our Savior, the Holy Spirit, and our worship each Sunday. So worship defined is declaring the worth of God with acts of reverence, which He ordained with a heart overflowing and with a life that we constantly live for Him. There's a beautiful illustration in our, in our Bibles of worship. If you'll turn over to Exodus chapter 30. And could I get someone to read for us verses 34 through 38. Exodus chapter 30 verses 34 through 38. Okay, so it's a teaching tool that God gives us there in Exodus chapter 30, verse 37. is very important. Underline that in your Bibles. <clears throat> this perfume that God instructs them exactly how to make, how to beat it down, turn it to a powder, set it before him. Verse 37, he said, this is for God alone. 
this part of worship, this, this incense, this perfume that's coming up, these ingredients, this is how you make it, but you only make it for God. Our worship is only for God. Our worship and that incense from, that rises up to God in our worship is only for Him, not for us. I mean, our singing encourages and edifies. Yes, we come together. It's been a hard week. Lots of battles that all of us are fighting. And it's good to be with my brothers and sisters each Sunday. But my focus, my focus for that time is only for God. It's only for Him that I am worshiping Him. Those prayers that I'm concentrating on and during that worship, it's only for Him. The Lord's Supper, that concentrating on the death of Christ, remembering what he went through because I sinned. That's for him. Giving. Yeah, there's things that have to be done with the collection from the saints, but that giving is a giving back to God. It's not, I'm not worried about the power bill. I'm not worried about the new addition. I'm not worried about the heat in the air. My giving is a worship to my God, thanking him the blessings that he's given me. Now, if we change our attitude and know the focus, what happens to us individually? What's our relationship to God become? Very personal. How does that help me on Monday? I'm looking forward to going back, right? Right? I'm not going for entertainment. I don't need entertainment. There's plenty of that on TV. I quit watching TV. It's the news people, they just yell at each other all the time. Everybody's mad at Trump. Everybody's mad at this person. I'm, I'm sick of all that. I just want to focus on God. The only thing, only thing I want in my mind is how I can be a better child to God. That's it. Life's too short, right? A lot of y'all have seen, we're on the daily Bible class we do on Facebook. A lot of y'all have seen that a few weeks ago, there's a little lady that Maurice and I have looked out for her. For, for well over 10 years, several, several years. I would go over, Marisa would go over on Sundays. She had no family, none. They were all gone. And all that she had basically was me and Marisa coming to see her. And I would try to convince her to become a Christian. I would try and tell her her life is coming to an end. So last Sunday before last, I went over and I, I told her, I said, um, you, you have just days. You don't have weeks. You have days before you're going to face judgment with God. Are you ready to make a decision? And she said, no. And I said, are you sure? Is there something <laughs> that we can look at to, to help you with this decision? You're fixing to stand before the throne of God with your life. And she said, I'm good. No. She died two days after that. Totally unprepared for coming. Worship to God keeps my mind, my personal focus on eternity, what's coming before me. I need you, you need me to, to help you on this journey, but my focus is on God. That path, that straight path, to him in eternity is where I want to go, right? And I said, no, that's where you want to go. You're here. But there's so many that are trying to be entertained in worship service. It ain't going to get you there. It just didn't. It's not the way God said to worship him. It ain't going to happen. We just read John chapter 4. Jesus said, you must. That's not an option. You must. Not you can or if you like to do it this way, or if the band shows up, you're entertained. It's not how it is. It's not there. You have to change the focus back to God. It's not what you can get. It's what you can give in worship. God alone. <clears throat> Andy Ritchie wrote a book on worship several years ago, and he gave a poem, and it had a description of worship. I'm going to share that with you. It says, worship is the soul searching for its counterpart. It's a thirsty land crying out for rain. It's a cradle in which a, a baby lies. It's a drop in quest of the ocean. 
Worship is a candle in the act of being kindled. It's the voice of the night calling for help. It's the sheep lost in the wilderness, pleading for the rescue by the good shepherd. Worship is the prodigal returning home to his, to his father. It's his soul standing in awe at the wonder of the universe. It's a poet enthralled by the beauty of the sunrise. It's a hungry heart seeking for love. It's a heart of love consecrated to its lover. It's a time flowing into eternity. One of the primary functions of the church is to supply incentives for worship and to provide the proper environment for worship. When worship is not the growing experience of Christians, the church could be at fault, or the individual could be at fault. If the church is at fault, it will eventually perish, it will die, unless it remedies the situation. The church has to be vibrant, and it has to have meaningful worship services. If it's the individual's fault, he'll dry up spiritually unless a change is made in his life because meaningful worship is at the heart and life of every Christian. So worship can be thought of as the jewel of the church. And that sounds strange if you consider the fact that the church spends so much time in worship, but the quantity is not a substitute for quality in worship. Going to church is not the same as going to worship. You understand that one? Just because, of, you know, you hear people say, oh, I went to church today. Well, did you worship? Did you worship God today? Oh, yeah, I guess so. If you have to say, I guess so, you might want to rethink just what you did during that period. So we have a challenge we have to challenge to grow in the worship defined <clears throat> that we defined earlier that it's worship, it's our focus in going there. And there's some questions we have to ask ourselves. Did I worship God today? Is worship a priority in my life? Do I faithfully attend services? And when I do, is my heart committed to God? Do I hunger and thirst to go to worship service? Do I hunger and thirst to be in the assembly with my brothers and sisters in Christ? There's a very close relationship <clears throat> between salvation, worship, and our service, our work that we do in the kingdom. Salvation comes down from God through Jesus for man. Worship rises up to God, to man, through Jesus. And service goes out from man to man God. So all of those are intertwined together and all th three are required from us, for us, by our God. There's a subtle danger of becoming more occupied with the visible than the invisible. Do you ever catch yourself doing that? Those things that I can see and those things that I can touch sometimes become more important in my life than those invisible things where we'll spend our eternity. And we have to, re I do, I have to rethink my life constantly and say, this is a danger. This, you need to back off on this. This is a danger in your spiritual life. Don't fall for this trap. Uh, we're doing a, our Bible class on Facebook right now in the book of James. We're talking about the trials of life and the trials that a Christian goes through and how James is there warning warning the Christians and what they need to be on, on guard for in their life and how they're supposed to come through these trials. And he, he emphasizes to the Christians that, it, that he's, to us, that he's writing this for, and inspired by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> these trials that are there, that these things that are happening, they're, they're not, evil things don't come from God. Those trials are there to refine us, to make us better, to make us stronger Christians. So when we come together to worship our God, we're even to thank him for those trials that we've gone through because he's trying to make us stronger Christians. It's not evil in your life to go through a trial. It's not sin in your life to go through a trial. It's trying to purify us and to make us a stronger and help us through difficult times and make us what God wants us to be.
Our worship to Him is a thankful for all the blessings, but even those times of our lives, so we're to thank Him for those too in our worship to Him. <clears throat> Any questions up to now? I know it's sort of even. Nobody? That's right. And our worship to God is thanking Him for that, for, for helping us through that and helping us to see that, to live that. That's right. I want to go into talking about um, Jesus and, and worship <coughs> and the importance of it. If you'll turn over to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. And then someone else turned to Romans chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2. So we've got 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, and Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Keep your finger there. Romans 12, 1 and 2. You got that, Darnell? Or anyone? Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. Worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable to Him. Okay. So, everybody heard the verses, right? Everybody hear them plain and clear, right? We're to present part of ourselves to God. Did anybody hear that? It's your whole selves. If you come into worship to God, He expects you, all of you, your whole person being concentrating on Him. Not part, not what's happening. Not the fire truck just went down the road, any of that. You're devoted to God, concentrating wholly on Him. Worship is not just an attachment to our lives. It's the core of our lives. It's the core of our very being comes out in our worship service. Jesus said in John 4, true worshipers. What did He mean by that? What's a true worshiper? What's true mean? The correct, the straight, the, the true, ne this is true worshipers. And the God, our Father, is what for those true worshipers? In verse number four says, the Lord Jesus is the living stone. And then verse five says, you also are like living stones. The Lord's life. And uh, do y'all do a lot of history research? Y'all yeah, think about it. Search like a history there around David's time or maybe first century. Have you ever studied how the priest and everything entered into the temple? And even when you know, the time of the Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees and them, and what they wore and all that, and what they were trying to present, they weren't doing it in their hearts, but they were trying to present to the people a reverence toward God and what they wore and how they entered and the, the rituals that they would go through to do that. <clears throat> what they're saying is when you come into the presence of God, or what Peter's saying and what Paul's saying in Romans, when you come in, God expects you. You're a priest. You're to act like a priest. You're to behave like a priest. You're to worship like a priest but from your heart, your spirit, from within you. True worship, real worship, not fake or putting on or because someone else or a grandma did it and that kind of thing. True worship is coming from your heart. Truly devoted. The core of your being is a worship to God. 
There's um, several different types of worship. Acts 17 describes vain worship. What does vain mean? Worthless. Useless. Worthless. Then there's those in Acts chapter 17, the Athenians, they were saying that they were ignorant in worship. What does the word ignorant mean? Unlearned. They were unlearned in their worship to God. So we have to be taught how to worship. We can't be ignorant. Where do we learn how to worship God? From the Scripture, and only from the Scripture. Man cannot teach you how to worship God. Only God can tell you how to worship Him. In Colossians 2, the agnostics there in Colossians 2 had a will worship. A self-styled worship is what that means. Will worship in Colossians 2 is calling a self-styled worship. They made up their own worship service. They decided how God should be worshipped, not God. Sound familiar? Much changed in 2,000 years? People still saying, I know it's not in there. I, those guys told me that yesterday. I know that's not in the New Testament, but I really think God would like this. Don't you think that if God liked it, he would have told you he liked it? He said, you can do that, that's fine. He would have let you know. <clears throat> I think one of the great eye-openers, uh, sometimes my mind go, tries to go there, it can't comprehend it, is when we see what our worship here is compared to what we're going to see worship truly is in eternity to our God. We get glimpses of it. We're told some of it. Paul tells us some of it. Jesus tells us some of it. <clears throat> but what we're doing here is preparing for there. So if we have a problem with our worship here, we're going to have a problem with our worship there. This is like a training ground. Paul talks about the body the same way, our, our earthly body, compared to our heavenly body. Our heavenly body is going to be glorious and powerful. And this is, Paul refers to this body as a tent. And I think sometimes, we, because we can see it, we can see things around here, we think that this is what worship is. And I don't think it's going to be even close to what worship really is in heaven. <clears throat> the only way we can get there now is to quit looking at the physical side of it and start looking at our hearts individually, looking at our hearts for worship. <clears throat> the worship of the true, the true God must be in the right form and not the wrong form. <clears throat> Why? Because not only is the right object established in Scripture for who is worthy of our worship, but he also tells us the right form and the right manner. <clears throat> there is... Um, some worship, like we were talking about a while ago, that self-styled worship in Leviticus chapter two, ver, uh, 10, verses 1 and 2. We had some ordained priests that were there, and they decided that they were going to do self-styled worship, and God struck them dead on the spot because they changed what he said and how he wanted to be worshipped. <clears throat> Saul, in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 8 through 14, he said, bring the offering and I'll offer it. Was that acceptable to God? Was that the way God said that he wanted to be, uh, sacrifices to be offered, that Saul was going to be able to do it, he could change it? No, he, he, he lost everything with God over that. I get it. So sometimes you'll hear uh, when you're having a Bible study with someone and you're talking about worship and, and what God has approved versus what man's approved, they'll say, what's the big deal? Well, it's simply this. God stipulated it. God said it. Man does not have the right to change it. Man can't change it. They might do it differently. They might do it away from what God has stipulated. And when you do that with anything... What's that called? When I do anything contrary to the law of God, there's a word for that. That's sin. Same with our worship. If we do it any way other than the way God has stipulated in his word, it's called sin. 
What happens when we sin? Are we in the presence of God? Is our worship even coming before God? No. No. That's how important it is. When Jesus prayed for unity, for, for oneness of the body of Christ, and praying that we would be the same as he and the Father were one, that all would be there. That oneness only comes from following God's word. You can't leave God's word and expect him to be, or do something contrary to what he's commanded, do something contrary to the law that he's given us, or the word that he's given us, and think that you're acceptable in God's sight. It's not going to happen. It never has happened. And God doesn't change. Does that make sense? Love God and keep his command with all your heart and soul, for this is the whole duty of man. That's right. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 through 9, and Uzzah, they were taught that the ark could not be touched. It was about to fall. It was about to fall off the cart because they were carrying it incorrectly, right? So you would think God would have to say, he's trying to help. And what happened? Why? Why did God strike him? David was even upset about it. Why, God? Why did you strike him dead? He was trying to help. That's exactly it. God said, don't touch it. You're not authorized to touch it. And he did. It's, everybody thinks that the Bible is gray. It's got these gray areas in there. It's like, no. The, the Bible's not gray. It's black and white. We try to make it gray try to fit around our own political motives or, or something like that. The Bible's pretty plain on every subject out there. The Bible is plain on every subject out there. It's us that try to make it pretty plain. There's nothing that you can do outside of the Word of God and make it acceptable to Him. It's, it's, he just tells us over and over, example after example, that's not going to happen. That won't happen. That will not happen because He said it. And when God says it, no matter what the subject is, that settles it. That's it. God says it, it's settled. No matter how much you think that, well, maybe this is going to be, God's going to overlook this. It ain't going to happen. <clears throat> Talked to a young man the other day on baptism, about becoming a New Testament Christian on baptism. <clears throat> I was telling him that's the only way you can enjoy the spiritual gifts we find in Christ is through baptism. He said, I, I'm just convinced you don't have to be baptized and I can stand before the throne of Christ and his blood's going to wash my sins away. And I said, where do you find that? Well, I've said a prayer. Show me the prayer. I need to know that I've, I've, I've read the Bible. I've studied the Bible. I need to know where this prayer is that everybody is saying that is saving them. He said, I don't know, but my preacher told me it was in there. Well, that's another thing, too. They say, well, I believe this, or I believe the Bible, I believe it like this. He said, not what you believe, it's what the Bible says. you got to go back. It's, it's not there. People are trying to change the Word of God through worship, through their lives, through their lifestyles, it's not there. <laughs> Consider the Pharisees over in Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 9. They had built their own self-styled worship. Um, <clears throat> today, today you'll see things like images or rituals or titles that people have put on other people. Where does that come from? Where does the, the word uh, nun or the word reverend, where does that come from? It's traditions of men. It's because they did it, so now we must do it because they must have done, said it was okay. And nobody ever goes back to the scripture to find out if it's true. Think about singing. <coughs> When did um, we change from a cappella to being the only, which I, the manner of the church, to you know, light shows and rock bands? 
Who said that was okay? It was all man. It's all tradition and man. You you go back to um, you can go back to, to even Italy, to into the catacombs, and you can still see the images there. And you can they'll tell you that they would come down and they would sing hymns in the catacombs. And it changed, not then, but through later, through accepting and a little bit and a little bit and a little bit. And they say, well, that must be okay because everybody else is doing it. And nobody's going back to the Word of God to find out how God said, worship me. When we come into the presence of God, how does he say he wants to be worshipped? We also can worship with the wrong attitude. If we eliminate all the false gods, all the images, uh, all the self-style modes of worship, our worship can still be unacceptable if we worship with the wrong attitude. When we come in to worship this Sunday, you have to have the correct attitude towards your worship. You've got problems with someone in the church, you need to go work it out. You've got problems with someone outside the church, work it out. Don't come into worship service with the wrong attitude. Don't come into worship service blaming God because something's going wrong in your life. You come into his presence to worship him with a correct attitude. There's some passages that illustrate that point. Uh, if you want to make them for your notes, we don't have time to go over them. But Malachi chapter 1, verses 6 through 14. Malachi chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Amos chapter 5, verses 21 through 27. Hosea chapter 6, verses 4 and 7. Isaiah chapter 1, 10 through 20. And the whole chapter of Mark, verse, uh, Mark chapter 7. The point is this. If you're doing the right things, the wrong attitude, or the wrong things, but you think you've got the right attitude and you're not using the word of God, both are wrong. You have to do it according to God's way and with the right attitude. That's what's acceptable to God. That's true worship, coming into his presence. Uh, next week for our lesson, we're going to discover true worship. We're going to... Oh, it's next week. Week after next, <coughs> unless y'all want to do this. No. Week after next, we're going to discover true worship. And we're going to go all the way through in this, this little mini-series. So when we come out on the other end, all of us will have a good understanding. Again, I would invite all of you to, if you have someone that, uh, you, that needs to be in here to hear what true worship is, week after next starts that series. Bring them with you. Okay? Let's close our class with a prayer. Holy Father, we come into your presence with our heads bowed. We bring our hearts before you, Father, thanking you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy, for your grace. Thanking you for our Savior. Help us each, Father, the day, that, every day that we live, live it for you. Live it before you. Walk in the light as our Savior is in the light. Please provide us with opportunities to teach the gospel. Those that are searching for the truth, help us, Father, to search them out and find them. We love you so much, Father, and we, we know you love us. We thank you, Father, again for this opportunity to come together tonight to encourage, to edify, to learn about how you want us to worship you so that we may grow closer to you and we can live stronger lives, our Christian faith, before those that see us, before each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.